I want to introduce you to Bob Greasy, young, talented quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. Bob, coming fresh from his Rose Bowl leadership quarterbacking Purdue, began his meteoric rise in professional football with the Dolphins in 1967. And with the expansion club, led his teammates to the Super Bowl as champions of the American Conference of the National Football League. In the record books, you'll find Bob's name mentioned often, such as highest percentage of passes completed in one game, that was in Shea Stadium against the Jets, and the most consecutive passes without any interceptions. Bob, after that loss to Dallas in the Super Bowl, what were your thoughts? Well, it was a, it was a, a sad way to end a successful season. And of course, uh, we were very happy to be in the Super Bowl, and when we we first start out the season, everyone's objective is be the be the best ball club in professional football. We were the second best ball club, and uh, the only way we accept the Super Bowl loss is the knowing that the fact that as a team and as an individual, we always learn more from losing than we do from winning. And uh, we go back and analyze our mistakes and say, well, why did we get beat, and why did the Dallas Cowboys beat us? And we can go back and look at the films and look at our mistakes, and when we come back and play that same team or in that same game the next time, we're going to be a little bit smarter, we're going to be a little bit better football player and a little bit better football team because we weren't poor losers. We didn't lose the ball game and say, well, uh, we were just off that day. We went back and we analyzed it and we found out why we got beat, the mistakes we made, and how we can be a better football team, and then the next time we're put through that test, will be able to win and uh, this is not only true in football professional football but also in ping pong or baseball uh, pitcher strikes you out or anything else any kind of sport where any kind of competition where you get you get beat you can always go back and analyze your defeat and be a smart loser rather than a poor loser bob when a young boy is thinking about playing uh, football uh, especially quarterbacking uh, how should he analyze himself what should he think about well, naturally, he should think about uh, the, the things that should go into making up a quarterback. Uh, physically, is he able to do it? Can he throw well? And uh, mentally, is he smart enough to comprehend everything that a quarterback has to comprehend? In my own situation, uh, I didn't start playing quarterback until I was 14 years old in, in uh, freshman in, in, in high school. Our grade school team did not have a, a football team uh, an organized football team in grade school and there was no other summer leagues that I played football in so the only thing I did the only thing I knew where I had a good arm was I was a pitcher in baseball in little league and all the other summer leagues uh, up until I got into high school and when I first went out for a football team the coach had known the fact that I was a good pitcher and he suggested that I try quarterback and, and fortunately uh, he had the foresight to see that I did have a good arm and had the mind to comprehend it. So you have to have the physical ability and also the mental capacity to play quarterback. Bob, what about some of the, the very basic ingredients of quarterbacking? Uh, like, for instance, uh, how do you receive the snap from center and how do you hold the ball, things like that? Well, these are very basic. We could go on and on and on and talk <laughs> about things of this sort, but uh, uh, very simply, I'll try to keep it as simple as I can. Uh, when you're taking the ball from center in a T-formation quarterback who is up underneath the center, if he's a right-handed quarterback, normally the right hand is put up against the bottom of the center, against his uh, uh, bottom of the center. The left hand, the left heel of the left hand and the right heel of the right hand are put together. And the fingers are spread, not rigidly, but uh, uh, firmly to accept the ball when it comes from the center. Uh, the, hand, the finger should be spread and the hand should be uh, ready to accept the football. And when the ball is placed there by the center, the first thing he should do, whether it's a running play, play or a pass play, is to bring the ball right into his midsection so that in turning around he won't get it knocked out of his hands by any of the backs that are coming through. What about movement away from the center, Bob? Uh, this has to be pretty fast, doesn't it? It certainly does, and uh, naturally the quicker a uh, quarterback can get away from the center, the better. And there are two divisions I split this into. If it's going to be a passing play is one. If it's going to be a running play, uh, you do something a little bit different. Let's take a passing play first. When you get the ball from center, you want to bring it up around your shoulders because uh, this is the way, this is the position you're going to go to right before you throw the football. After you get the ball from center, bring it up to your shoulders and grip the ball as if you're going to pass it and uh, get back uh, five or seven yards or whichever the pattern dictates. Get set up as fast as you can and be prepared to throw the football. If you're going to be, uh, if it is a running play, the first thing you want to do when you get it from the center is to bring it into your midsection and keep it in close. Now, if you're going to be faking the one back and give it to the other, you want to wheel and deal from a position where the ball is right in your midsection. In other words, don't keep your arms <clears throat> extended. 
not uh, two or three yards away from your two or three feet away from your body. Keep the ball in close to your body so when the fullback comes by, he won't knock it out of your hands if you're just faking it to him. Fake it to him and bring it back into your midsection. And then when the second back comes, and then stick it back out and hand it off to him. So you wheel and deal from a position close to your body. Bob, you mentioned uh, getting the ball up at shoulder uh, level approximately if it's going to be a passing play. Uh, how do you grip the ball, uh, the football, when you are preparing to pass it? Well, this is a, that's a very tough question to answer. Uh, very basically, if you have a small hand, you want to hold it near the smallest part of the ball, which is at the end. If you have a larger hand and you can, and the ball feels a little smaller to you because of your, your large hand, you can hold it more toward the center of the ball. And I think this would probably be the best way to hold it toward the center, but I don't have big hands, and I hold it toward the smaller part of the ball. And uh, I think my smallest finger and the, my ring finger on my right hand are both on the laces. Uh, the, my middle finger is midway between the end of the laces and the end of the football. My index finger is up near the tip of the football, and this is where I get the control of the football. And of course, the thumb is on the other side, and I don't hold it real firmly, uh, real tight, but I hold it firmly and always have I always have some air between the palm of my hand and the football. I never have the palm of my hand on the football. It's it's a situation where you want to control it with your fingertips and not the palm of your hand. You throw a baseball with your fingertips, you dribble a basketball and shoot a basketball with your fingertips, and you should throw a football with your fingertips and not the palm of your hand. Now, Bob, I know at your uh, annual summer camp, football camp for boys, uh, you and a lot of other Miami Dolphins spend a lot of time teaching youngsters uh, uh, basics like uh, how do you learn to pass uh, more proficiently, uh, how do you learn to run, things like timing. Uh, would you care to comment on those things briefly? Well, uh, the best way you can do that is practice. That's the, the simplest way to do it. Uh, passing uh, is so much involved. We've talked about uh, the, the, the grip on the football. There's also the release. Uh, when I used to play baseball, I used to throw a baseball three quarters, uh, almost sidearm. Uh, when I got into playing football, the first thing they did was correct me and had, him, had me throwing the ball, delivering it straight overhand. And uh, this is uh, a way you can release it quicker and I think get better accuracy. So uh, practice makes perfect. It's an old adage, but it's very true. And in passing, that's what I try to do, uh, get the right release, get the right grip, and then also the right wrist action. And a lot of people say, well, how do I throw a spiral? A lot of young boys ask me, how do you throw a spiral? It's not whether or not you throw a spiral. It's whether or not the ball is completed and it gets there on, on its target with the least <laughs> amount of time in the air. So a lot of my passes, I'd say 75% uh, of my passes are not spirals. But they're close enough to being spirals that the fact that it's not a perfect spiral doesn't slow it down any. So it, it all depends on the grip the release of the football and an overhand, and an overhand uh, passing motion and then the wrist action all combined are uh, what, uh, what you need to really practice on. Bob, how would you evaluate uh, the advancement of a young man in the position of quarterback, say, after uh, six months or a year or two? Uh, how can he look at himself and know if he's uh, making any progress? You got some tough, tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> we got some tough boys playing quarterback, too. Well... Uh, it took me longer than most people, I think. Uh, some people they catch on a little quicker, and other people, they don't catch on so fast. If, if a boy really wants to play quarterback and has the ambition to play it, if he has the equipment, the mental and the physical equipment, and he has the coaching, someone to tell him exactly how to do it, I'd say he's in good shape. If he's got the determination, the utensils to do it, and the coach to instruct him, I think he should stick with it. If he can perform in another position better and he's getting frustrated at quarterback, I would say wherever he can help his team out, that's where he should play. But if a, if a, if a fella is doing well at quarterback and wants to improve, the best way he can do that is to practice and to listen to what his coach says. Bob, you mentioned uh, mental and physical attitudes. I want to in inject a question here uh, uh, as far as the coaching is concerned. What about the establishment of bad habits, uh, learning things uh, the incorrect way? How serious is this? Well, it's a very serious problem, especially when you're young, because this is when you're forming your habits. And, uh, and uh, I think the easiest way to form a bad habit is when you're tired. After you've run a lot, and then you're tired, and you're trying to throw a football, and you, you really don't have the energy to throw it the right way because you're so tired. So you throw it the wrong way, the easiest way, and this is how you get into a lot of bad habits. And I think the best way to do it is for a coach who knows what he's doing to, to watch his ball player and to instruct him at all times. If the coach does not know exactly 
the proper procedures of a quarterback and how to grip and how to throw and what to look for and what not to look for, the coach should attend a clinic, a coach's clinic, or something of this sort, because at these clinics there are a lot of good ideas exchanged, not only on quarterbacking, but on a lot of other positions. But primarily on quarterbacking, if a coach does not know enough about it, he should attend the clinic and find out so he can go back and relate to his ball player the right things to do. What uh, private practice routines? You know, a youngster uh, can't play football all the time. Uh, what private individual practice routines could you suggest during the off-season or during additional time that a youngster could, uh, could do to help his proficiency? Well, mainly I would say uh, uh, strengthening his arm and his body. And uh, you can strengthen your arm and your body by, by lifting weights. I lift hand weights in the off-season, just a 10-pound hand weight, and I do a, a curl, and then I'll do a, an overhead action like I'm throwing a football, but I'll actually have a 10-pound weight in my hand, and I'll be acting like I'm throwing a football, uh, throwing a weight. And uh, these is, this is one thing he can do. Does a football weigh 10 pounds <laughs> no, except does. when it's very I, wet? <laughs> I don't think I can throw a spiral with a weight either. <laughs> but uh, running is another good exercise. Uh, I'm very uh, keen on the idea that a good quarterback has to have good legs, and, and uh, just like a pitcher has to have strong legs, a quarterback has to have strong legs also. So running, uh, quick feet is very important, and quick eye and hand coordination. Uh, a good, a good uh, coordination between hand, hand and eye is very important also. Uh, so uh, anything that uh, that keeps a quarterback in shape in the off season and keeps his uh, his quickness going, I think quickness is another important thing. Uh, throwing the football, not long throws, uh, ten yards, just get back and forth and lob the ball back and forth, and just practice your release. And that's the way I start out every year. I don't start out throwing fifty and sixty yard passes. I start out ten yards apart from one of my receivers playing catch and working on my release, and then I increase a little bit uh, after that. Bob, you mentioned uh, the importance of having your legs and uh, your whole body in shape. I know that uh, you don't run much with a football, but I do know that you have several plays in the playbook for the Dolphins in which you can run, and I have seen you run several times in the Orange Bowl. Uh, how would you evaluate uh, the position of running to a quarterback as opposed to uh, holding the ball, handing it off, uh, running the team? I think the quarterback ought to leave the running to the running backs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, occasionally a, a play uh, by the quarterback is good, but I'm thinking professionally now in, in football that uh, the, the quarterbacks get paid too much to uh, perform their their art, and that's passing and leading a ball club and knowing the defenses. He shouldn't be out running around where he can get hurt, and that's why he's going to hurt his ball club. But uh, a quarterback draw is about the only running play that we have in our playbook that I'm uh, uh, supposed to run the ball, aside from a quarterback sneak. Does uh, the coach uh, get mad at you if you ever have to scramble and run the ball? Occasionally he does, <laughs> and um, you know this is uh, this is a busted play. I don't start out scrambling from from the inception of the play. When it's called in the huddle, it's not a scramble. The only time that that I break out of the pocket and scramble is when the receivers are covered and the protection is broken down, and some other quarterbacks who don't have the ability to scramble would just fall down and take the loss. And I, I have the ability to scramble out of the pocket to give my receivers three or four more seconds to get open, or if they can't get open, to at least make a positive play out of a busted play and run upfield and get some yards and, and make it a positive play. And that's, that's the only way I look at scrambling. And, and young quarterbacks should not think about scrambling right from this time they get the ball from center. Only use that as a, uh, an extra added uh, device for the offense against the defense when the play is busted and it won't work. But stay with the original play as long as you can. Bob, how important would you say it is to know every single individual strength uh, or weakness of your teammates? Well, when you do it, when you quarterback professionally and you do it for a living, it's, it just goes without saying that you know whatever they can do uh, best and what they can't do best. You almost have to follow them to their homes and find out how good a cook they are and how, <laughs> how poor a, uh, a cook they are. But uh, for younger boys, uh, it's tough because they have a lot of schoolwork to get in high school and in college, and it's tough for them to, to devote as much time as I do and professional quarterbacks do but the but the big thing is uh, the time that they do devote to football to to know your offensive people as well as you can know your wide receivers and what patterns they run best and which patterns they run uh, not so well so they can feature those patterns and not call the patterns that they don't run if it's a crucial third and ten situation you certainly don't run want to call a pattern that they're not capable of running that well 
Also, you want to know the capabilities of your running backs. Uh, do they run better wide than they do inside? Do they run better their, to their right or to their left? Do they block well for each other? Is one a stronger blocker than the other? Uh, your offensive line, you got to know who your best blocking offensive lineman is, both on a run and on a pass. You got to know who to give your uh, help to on a pass play. If you go to keep a back end, you got to know which lineman to, to, to help out. You have to know everything about your offensive people, and uh, this makes uh, your play calling more selective and, and helps out in the long run. Uh, how would you say a, a young quarterback ought to feel about uh, whether a coach uh, uh, sends the plays in or calls the plays from the sideline or lets him uh, call his own plays? I don't think uh, a young quarterback should be uh, embarrassed or uh, put out any if a, a, a coach calls the plays from the sideline. Uh, we had this situation in college, in fact, they called the plays for me, and I appreciated it because I was just a young quarterback, didn't have the time to devote that I do now to learning the game, to studying the films, to, to knowing my offense and defensive personnel inside and out. I had to study. I had to go to classes. The coaches were at football 100% of their time, and they knew what they were doing, and they called the plays. And uh, uh, if, if a quarterback feels that he's capable of calling them, fine. But uh, a lot of times, young people aren't capable. And if the, quarter, if, the, if the coach is capable of doing it, I would say that the quarterback should go along with whatever the coach decides. Let's talk about another uh, facet of quarterbacking, Bob. Uh, we've talked about how important it is to know your teammates and their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it's pretty important to know what the opposition's strengths and weaknesses are, too, isn't it? Well, that's what the game's all about. <laughs> If they get a guy over there that's got a bad leg, uh, you're not going to wait around to the fourth quarter to find out how bad it is. And uh, this is this is only normal. This is what we do. And uh, um, again, going back to what we said offensively about the knowing your offensive people, uh, it's even more important to know each and every person on the defense what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are, and to attack them at their weakness and to attack them at their strengths if that's what you want to do. But by the time the game comes on Sunday, for me, I could almost write a, a three-page essay on each and every player on the defensive team. That goes from defensive tackle, defensive end, linebackers, defensive backs. And, and this is what the young people should try to do also with the time that they have. Uh, find out who is their best ball player and who is their weakest and, and know who your weakest and who your strongest ball players are and then try to put your strengths against their weaknesses and, and to attack them that way. Uh, you don't want to knock your head against a, a brick wall trying to get through it if you can walk around it and beat them the same way. So you want to know what their weaknesses is and how to beat them the easiest way. Bob, thinking back to uh, when you were 14 and just beginning your career as quarterback, uh, how much time uh, do you remember spending uh, uh, studying for your position and working at it? Not a whole lot. Uh, I was more involved in my studying than I was uh, studying my classes than I was studying football. But uh, the big thing I think I did was each and every day that I was out on the football field, I devoted 100% to whatever I was doing. If I was in the classroom, most of the time I was listening to what the teacher or the instructor was saying. If I was out in the hall talking with uh, some of my friends, I was 100% involved in that. When it came time for football practice, I forgot about the friends and the social study life. I forgot about the classes, and I went out and I did the best I could and gave 100% attention to what the coach was saying and to what we were trying to, to do on the field that day. And I think this is uh, very important. You don't have a lot of time to devote to it, but the time that you do, you certainly want to get 100% of the time that, that you're spending doing it. So uh, that's probably the best thing that I can say for a, a young a uh, young person who doesn't have a lot of time to devote to his football, to, to the time that he does have, and he is out there on the football field, to pay attention and to give it 100%. Would you say that this held true uh, right through your days at Purdue uh, up until you became a professional full-time quarterback, Bob? Exactly. Uh, the same way at uh, Purdue when I was in classes, 100% there and out on the football field, and any extra time when I was studying football was 100%. Now that I don't have any classes to study, I go 100% all the time on football, and uh, during the football season, it kind of gets uh, some long days and some long weeks. So in the off season, I try to get away from it, and that's how I get my diversity in as far as football uh, conscious all the time. And then in the off season, I forget about it completely. Now, during football season, Bob, I've seen you walking around with a book about two and a half, three inches thick under your arm. Uh, these young fellows that are learning uh, the quarterback position, uh, they have a lot of plays to learn. But you ha also have for games what you call a short list, don't you? 
That's correct. Uh, we have a, a whole list of football plays, and a lot of people who don't know much about football say, geez, that must be a lot of plays to remember. Well, it all fits into a pattern, and it all fits into a scheme, and it doesn't take a whole lot of studying to put every one of those plays in your head, and after a while, you don't even look at the book. It's just something that's there, and it's uh, if you carry it around, it's just a... Uh, I don't know, a 10-pound piece of luggage that you have to carry around because you don't need it. You've got it in your head, and that's where you should have it. But uh, that's the important thing. And uh, uh, during the season, we don't have all those plays in for each game. We'll go to them and pull out four or five of the plays that we feel that will work best and, and use those and feature those plays. And some of the plays that are in the playbook may not work th this next week, so we'll, we'll keep those for a future game. Right. Bob, we've talked about uh, the position of quarterback. Uh, would you mind summarizing your thoughts for uh, the young men who might be listening to us right now? Well, first of all, I think conditioning is probably one of the most important things. Uh, you can't go out and do anything unless you're in shape for it. And uh, this is the first thing that I do each and every year before I even start throwing is I start running and try to get my, my wind and also my legs in shape. So overall conditioning is very important. Uh, of course, the proper coaching and learning, uh, this is very important also. And uh, if, a, if one quarterback has a good coach and another quarterback has a coach that isn't so uh, well-versed in quarterbacking, the first, the first quarterback, no question about it, is going to have an advantage over the second. But uh, if, if the second quarterback is, is capable of learning a little bit quicker and a little bit better and understands if his ears are as big as elephant ears when something is said, <laughs> and he can remember as well as an elephant, then uh, he's going to be better off than the first boy. So proper coaching and learning is, is very important also. Dedication and desire, I can't say enough about that. Uh, we talked a little bit about that briefly, about dedication. Whenever you're on the football field, 100% to what you're doing. And desire, always wanting to be the best at whatever you're doing. And this is what life is all about, not only football. is Anything that you do, you want to be the best at it. And if you're not happy with what you're doing and you don't want to be the best, then you better get out of that profession and get into something else. Concentration is very important. Always knowing uh, what you want to do and how you're going to go about doing it. Um, I remember in my rookie year, uh, I was playing in a ball game and I saw the defense doing something and I knew what I wanted to do and I didn't know how to call it to get it done. And that's the, the last time that I ever went into a professional football game without being prepared. And uh, concentration plays a big part of it. And, and uh, there's an old saying around uh, at least the Miami Dolphins that you play the way you practice. So each day in practice, you should have the same concentration and the same drive and motivation in practice that you do when you play the game uh, whenever your game is scheduled. But uh, practice, uh, you, you, pray, you play the same way you practice. And then finally, I think uh, uh, you should uh, be able to throw the football, no question about it. Uh, the things that we talked about, working on your release, working on getting set up as fast as you can away from center, uh, working on your techniques of, uh, of handing off, of, of being the quarterback, of having the leadership in the huddle. The controlling the, uh, the huddle is one of the most important things a quarterback does because when he steps in the huddle, he should own it, and he should know each and every person in that huddle what they can do and what they can't do best. And uh, he should tell them what to do and get them out of the huddle, get them up the line of scrimmage, call the play. If it's going to be a pass play, get back quick, set up and throw, and practice your throwing. If it's going to be a running play, you should take the ball from center, keep it into his midsection, and wheel and deal from there and not, not have the ball knocked out of his hand by one of the defensive people coming in or one of the running backs going by that he's faking the ball to. But it's, it's tough to explain quarterbacking in such a short time, but I think we've covered most of the important parts. Thank you very much, Bob Greasy.